There's been a wave of new Don't Starve content, and I do think that there is a ton of interesting things that were added, and a lot of things that this update has brought up in regards to things that I think about for this game, and more specifically, the content that's been coming out recently. So let's cover what is probably the biggest change, and that's the change done to the caves, which is just an overall sweeping rework to something that's been around for a long time, and that's the way that caves work. So prior to this update, there was a big desync between the surface and the caves in the way that the borders work in that you and other things weren't able to fly over gaps, which includes things like bats, ghosts, uh, the light bugs, you know, things like that. Which meant that the quote-unquote void in the caves essentially acted as walls that you couldn't traverse through normal means. Now with this update, they changed that. So now if you fall into the void, you fall in as similar to how the ocean works on the surface. This does, however, mean that void walking is dead, and that's very unfortunate. But in its place, however, you now have the ability to fly over gaps as ghosts, which can help with resurrecting in the caves, as now you can fly straight to a touchstone or structure, as well as just flying to the atrium to find where it is. Though, you know, without void walking, I don't really think it matters, unfortunately. As a more widespread helpful option, however, we now have bridges that can span across small gaps. These are relatively cheap, but they do only span across small gaps, which sucks whenever it comes to things that are just out of range of the bridges. These do not, however, work in the atrium and the labyrinth, with you simply having the ability to place them down in any of the tiles to span any gaps. This change, I'm not gonna lie, does kind of make me upset. So the idea behind this update is sort of to remove void walking and replace it with something that players have been asking for. You know, that being in the form of the bridges. And while I do like the inclusion of them, I also can't help but feel like removing void walking entirely as a mechanic is not the way to go about fixing this. You know, while void walking was just blatantly cheating in order to make going to certain areas of the cave substantially easier and more convenient, I can't help but feel like in limiting where you put the bridges, you sort of miss the point of why people were void walking to begin with. Really, the only players who would regularly void walk were the people who would do things like clear out the ruins anyways, and clear out the labyrinth and do all sorts of things that still hold value, and exploring and clearing out the areas that you would think people would use void walking to skip entirely. But the reality of the situation is that players who would regularly do those things tend to use void walking as a way to skip the tedium of constantly maneuvering around the labyrinth, as well as the atrium and all these things over and over as often as they do. I can't help but feel like this change was just kind of whack all things considered. It doesn't really help alleviate the tedium that comes with things like farming those high value areas and only slightly helps alleviate the problems that come with exploring the caves, given the restrictions that comes with setting those things up. Moving along though, there are a couple interesting things to note in regards to some other new introductions into the world. We can start with the new types of rabbits that were introduced. So now there's a new archetype of rabbits that when caught turns into a rabbit king. This Rabbit King is basically just an NPC which trades items with you, as long as you don't have any meat in your inventory. But more on that later. As far as the items go when you trade with him, you can get a horn, which is just a tool, a vest, which, you know, takes up the body slot, and a hat, all of which have different functions. Starting off with the vest, this just befriends bunny men near you without needing to feed them. You know, there are many different ways to use this item, but the most prominent uses are probably going to be to befriend bunny men during things like, you know, the moonstorms to auto attack nearby corrupted birds or to deal with bosses like Bee Queen or Antlion. And as far as the rabbit wreath goes, it's basically just a fun hat at worst and allows you to pick up rabbits at best. There's not really much to say about the hat, all things considered. But once again, be sure to not have any meat around this NPC since that does cause the otherwise friendly NPC to turn into a hostile boss. This boss fight is pretty much the same as any other boss that spawns minions to fight for it. You need to find a way to control slash manage the minions while also focusing on dealing as much damage as you can with the main body. It gets a bit annoying, you know, you should probably bring other people with you and the drops are kind of whatever. You know, dropping the Rabbit King cudgel which scares away bunny men regardless of your quote unquote stats. So you know, if you're a monster character or you have meat on you, uh, the bunny men just won't attack you on sight. Additionally, it does deal bonus damage to bunny men. Otherwise, it's essentially a tentacle spike with sanity drain. So, yeah, you pretty much never want to fight this thing and would much rather it be friendly to buy horns from. Though it does count as tier two shadow stuff for Maxwell purposes, so maybe that's something that you're interested in. 
Easily the most interesting aspect of this new NPC though, is the new item, the Rabbit Horn, which spawns a burrow that is basically just a portable inventory space, similar to something like Maxwell's Top Hat. These, similar to the Top Hat storage, do not transfer between shards however, so just be aware of that. Their durability is also kind of low, so you know, you probably carry one or two of these things on you in case you're doing something like going through the ruins and need an extra hand, so to speak. But I digress. Next up are the mobs that are found where a bulk of the content is, and that is the caves. These mobs include a new type of nightmare creature, which spawns specifically from nightmare fissures in the caves. You know, there are no new drops about this, but it's an interesting fighting pattern at the very least. There's also a new boss that spawns from Depth Worm attacks, being the Giant Depth Worm. This thing is a powerhouse, and dealing with it takes quite a bit of effort and quite a bit of tools and ingenuity in regards to how you're supposed to fight it. So ideally, you're supposed to feed this thing and then hit it. So if you give it something like, I don't know, pick a light bulb and then drop it on the floor and start leaving a trail behind you, then eventually it does do an eating animation and that's supposed to be your window to fight the actual thing. Though I will say, this is a problem. <laughs> like, the giant depth worm has an issue where if you're fighting in a group or if you're just like doing something like clearing the ruins within a group and you get hit with a depth worm attack that just happens to have one of these, each person has their own chance of spawning that depth worm. Which means, if you're traveling in a group clearing something like the ruins, you're gonna get jumped by like three of these bosses. Which is really funny, don't get me wrong. But also, I can see being an actual problem and being incredibly annoying. You know, I think this is definitely something that Clay should address. You know, I think it's kind of, it's kind of ridiculous if I'm being honest. But on the other hand, the drops are really good, and it is funny to get jumped by three of them. I don't know, I'm a little bit torn on this. I think, as far as the health of the game goes, it's probably a good idea to just, like, tone it down a little bit in regards to how often these things spawn and whether or not they can spawn on groups of people. Uh, in regards to, like, you know, each person gets their own individual one. But, you know, I, I've been talking about this random boss enough, I think. After this is all post rift content. So you do have to kill Fuel Weaver in order to have access to the following content. Starting off with the Icker, this drops from the ceiling to attack the player, and they only drop Nightmare Fuel, though that's not the main appeal to them. Ickers, when attacked, lose bits of themselves, and you can choose to use the empty pearl bottles to pick up their Icker goop. This goop can be used to either drastically slow down enemies by throwing at them, or alternatively, you can use it to make another new item, called the Icker Preserve Jar. This item just stores items in it, and if it has freshness, then it simply doesn't lose any freshness. I'm not gonna lie, I can't really find a overly, you know, practical use for this. It's like slightly more convenient to get items out of than a bundling wrap, and it displays the items in it, so it's fine for like, decorations. It basically turns the otherwise bundled food that might help you during a fight, such as Volt Goat Jelly and things like that, into something that you could store with all of the tools that you have to go fight a boss. Its added convenience also isn't terrible, but, you know, it's... Realistically, you could probably just use the bundling wrap, if I'm being honest. There is an interesting interaction with things like Sunfish and Ice Creams, however, where you can store them in it, and the Icker Preserve Jar basically just lets them function as a worse, you know, skilled furnace or... I guess the most comparable thing for freezing is the crystallizer. But you know, just be careful when unloading slash reloading the area with sunfish, since they do still cause fires when in the preserve jar, which is pretty funny, admittedly. There's also a new member of the Shadow Not-So Trio named the Rictus. This is a mob that you have to deal AoE damage to in order to quote unquote reveal, and can be very annoying to deal with. Its drops are basically identical to the Shadow Trio, but this thing will linger in the miasma caused by the dreadstone peeking out from the rifts and try to poke and prod at you, which is very annoying. You basically have to deal AoE damage to this thing because you can't directly attack it head on. Making things like the bramble husk or anything that has thorns damage tremendously useful when fighting it. Next up is the new mimic, which just copies the look and loot of the normal ornate chest. 
These things look pretty much the same in comparison to the chests you find in things like the Labyrinth and the Ruins. Once you open it, it attempts to attack you and steal items from you, and killing it will drop all the loot in it, including your stolen items. But letting it eat a Shadow Atrium will cause it to spit out a Possessed Shadow Atrium, which is a new item that's used in crafting of other new items, but more on that later. Following up with the theme of this, however, are the standard Mimics, aka the Mimic Creeps. I don't know if this is just a me thing, but you know, after Mimic Ghouls, I've been seeing a ton of like, just Mimics being referenced everywhere. I don't know if that's just me, but you know, I digress. These things are mostly harmless. They just look around for items that are left on the floor in the caves and take their place. Basically just leaving two in the same place at once. They're mostly harmless once again, and you can equip them and everything when, when you try to actually use them, they'll jump out of your hand and hit you for minus 10 sanity, then just scurry off. They can't be attacked and the only way for you to really kill them is to step on them, which is whatever. Going back to the possessed shadow atrium though, this is used for the crafting of the newest lines of items, including some new tools. The Gloomerang is a new weapon that throws a projectile that eventually does return to the player. It does not, however, deal damage on the way back to that player. Honestly, this thing looks more like a Terraria weapon than a Don't Starve weapon, but regardless, I am a big fan of it. You know, it's a new and actually decent ranged weapon, which we've been getting a couple of those recently, which, you know, I'm a fan. Following up is the Shadow Maul, this thing is either a weapon that has life steal to it, as it has a leveling system where when you kill bosses with it, it increases its damage per each stage. These stages do deplete over time and you can kill enemies with it in order to maintain its stages, but overall this item's pretty neat, or alternatively you could use it as an axe because, you know, it is still an axe, which is pretty epic. I'm kind of torn on this item for the most part. I feel like it being reliant on killing bosses and having to manage both its durability and its quote-unquote strength meter as an invisible stat makes it kind of annoying to use as a consistent weapon, especially considering it doesn't cross the 50 damage threshold at the base level. Though its lifesteal isn't anything to scoff at, with it being slightly higher lifesteal rate than a bat bat, making it a pretty solid option for Wormwoods. Next up is something that makes me feel incredibly vindicated as far as, you know, previous content goes, and that is new beefalo items. There's a new saddle called the Nightmare Saddle, which is slightly faster than the normal saddle, but not as fast as the Glossomer Saddle. Additionally, it provides an additional 18 planar damage to beefalo, making it strictly better than the War Saddle, barring damage modifiers like Warly's food. You know, it's pretty good. I'm a fan of the saddle, but that's not really where the highlight of the beefalo stuff is, in my opinion. The beefalo gloom bell is an alternative to the beefalo bell, and it's functionally the same thing, but with some major bonuses. A beefalo bound to a gloom bell has its manure disappear after five seconds, making it significantly less annoying for picking up after. And additionally, and this is the good part, it can revive beefalo that are bound to it. When your beefalo dies while being bound to that gloom bell, its corpse sticks around, and you can revive it with the bell, costing half of your maximum health and 100 sanity. This is incredibly useful, and an amazing late game item, and is basically exactly what I was asking for in one of my previous videos where I talk about Beeflo, and how they needed some way to revive them as a new support option. You know, I'm a huge fan of this item, but my one complaint is that I can't get it earlier, which is, you know, a pretty good segue into the next thing that I want to talk about, which... Depending on the length of this video, I might save for another time, since this video is probably already long enough as it is, and the topic that I want to talk about is something that's kind of complicated, and probably best put into a separate video where we have a good old discussion about it. So, you know, maybe that's something to look forward to. That's probably something to look forward to. I don't think I'm going to include it in this video, if I'm being honest. But that's basically everything I wanted to talk about when it comes to the new content. I think a lot of it is pretty cool, pretty neat. And at the very worst, it's more content, you know, and I can't complain about having more, you know what I mean? Uh, but with all that being said, you know, that's all I want to talk about. So until next time, buh bye bye